<laughs> but while we were gone, it was Valentine's Day, and so uh, uh, I wanted to share with you my Valentine card from Greg uh, to me, uh, and we're going to give it to you as well. This says, for my wife on Valentine's Day. Everybody go, ah, ah, blessings. Okay. He says, when something needs doing, I don't always, maybe you should be reading this. Uh, yes. Yes, that, yes, Greg, come on up, Greg, come on. Okay. <laughs> when something needs doing, I don't always do it. No amens here. When something needs fixing, I don't hop right to it. When the checkbook's a mess, I may throw a fit. When the going gets tough, I've been known to quit. When I shampoo and shave, I may splash up the floor, and the junk I collect may spoil our decor. When I start off each day, I don't always smile. Pregnant pause. When we step out to dine, it may not be in style. I may have my faults, but one thing's for sure. I did something right when I married you. Happy <laughs> Valentine's Day. You're cute, huh? <sighs> so Greg and I just wanted to say we have done something right to feel connected with you guys. We just consider it such a privilege, and um, we know that... Our source of all love uh, uh, is, is Jesus Christ. And so we love you with our hearts, with, with our emotions, and we also love you with the Spirit of God. And we feel like we've done something right to be able to have you in our lives. Bless you. Good card, Greg. Good card. Good job. Now, I'm going to jump right in. For those of you that don't know, we're in our, just finished our first month of the planting of my church. And so our goal in this first season was to be able to relate and impart some of our DNA, our attributes, and our characteristics to help uh, build a current of the Spirit of God, a culture of the Spirit of God, so that we all know why we're here, what we're doing, but also that we have the, the communication ability to be able to tell someone else that as well. But we're not doing this from a teaching position. We're doing this from an impartation uh, place. And uh, those of you that know, I've been part of Christian International um, in the States. Um, I'm trying to think how many years. Um, uh, over 35, so um, I must have joined as a baby, and um, <laughs> but over 35 years. And in that time, there are some obvious traits in DNA that we have recognized that associated with Christian International. Now, we are not promoting a stream, a denomination, or a membership. As you've noticed, nobody's asked you for any of that. But what we are saying is there's there is, with every family, there's characteristics that cause you to be able to recognize that's a family, whether it is physical characteristics, whether it is uh, uh, communication or, or, or the way they might act characteristics, there's, or even sometimes sickness characteristics, things like that, that are part of a family. I believe the same is true with a stream, with a denomination, with a network. There's characteristics or attributes of that family. If you don't know the strengths, you don't know how to take advantage of those. And I, th I think I shared with you last time when I was here, I had just been speaking to Dr. Bill Hammond, and I don't know how we got on this topic, but he was saying, you know, the, the scripture that says, when you pray, believe, uh, and that you receive it in what you pray that, that God will give it to you. And Sharon paraphrased. And he says, I think we got our praying part down good. I think we got our believing part down good. He says, I still think the body of Christ is struggling with their receiving part. And you know, when he said that to me, it kind of settled deep on the inside of me. And I realized I need to upgrade my receiving part. 
not just here with information, not even just here with an encounter. I need to receive with manifestations as well as what the Spirit of God has said. And so I'm believing that for you uh, also. And so I heard last week, uh, you did not have the stage here. You did not have all the microphones and all the equipment, but this is what I heard. I heard you had uh, the Holy Spirit here. I heard Apostle Tommy blessed you greatly. We got a lot of good testimonies, and uh, uh, I knew he would. I didn't need your testimonies to be able to know that, but uh, it was good to hear. I think I might even share some of them with him, because isn't it interesting how you tell somebody else someone did well, but you don't always tell that person. So I may share some of those with him. And it's so good to see so many friends and new acquaintances here. But we've already gone over the apostolic prophetic. We've already gone over uh, impartation activation. Tonight, I want to go over the reproducing anointing. If there is any anointing uh, that is probably the strongest in Christian International, that is it. You never find a one-off there. You never find a prophet. You find prophetic teams. You never find uh, someone that is healed, you find a healing team. You, you never find someone that uh, has storehoused all the truth, so th- they're a specialist. You find trainers and teachers and imparters, because that is part of our DNA that is within each one of us. And so I want to jump in at that point, but I want to jump in kind of from my personal development in the area of God developing me as a reproducer. And I know it may be a, 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 a history for some, but at 17 years old, uh, that morning, I had received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That night, I had a dream. In this dream, I was standing in the middle of a great multitude of children, young people, youth. And when I would turn, they would be of a different color, a different race, and they would wear different uh, clothes that represented different cultures. And so being so mature in the Lord, you know, not even 24 hours, I assumed that the Spirit of God was calling me to be a missionary. Doesn't that sound right? And so the next morning, I got up and I went to someone more mature in the Lord than myself, which was anybody at that point. And so I went to someone more mature in the Lord myself, and I shared with them my dream because I was awed. I was excited. Uh, you know, I was, I was kind of nervous. You know, this, this was all new to me. And this was a precious uh, minister in the Lord. And this is what they said to me. They said, Sharon, you need to take that and you need to put that on the shelf. And, uh, you know, when you get more mature in the Lord, you know, God may touch it or he may not touch it, but he'll show you whether it was really from him or whether it was not from him. And I want you to know, I did not leave depressed or anything. I definitely didn't leave with any answers, but I did not leave depressed at that point but I recognized something uh, that was going on on the, on the inside of me. And one of the things that, that I recognized was God had birthed in me a heart for the next generation. Now, before we start thinking youth and young people, I believe that was for the generations to come. I believe that includes all of us. That's not just age or gender biased there. It includes every one of us. But anyway, when I had this dream, it, uh, it woke me up, and so I began to pray. And when I began to pray, I began to use words that I was not familiar with. And some of the words that I was uh, using was words like revival, awakening for future generations. I was praying for the har- great harvest of souls. But I also started to pray for spiritual fathers and mothers that would rise up for the interest and welfare of revival in our cities and in our nations. And there was something going on as I was praying those things. Didn't have a lot of of intellectual understanding, but something was happening in my spirit. I was getting God's heart for reproducing and that which is going to touch the next generations. Now, if you would hear someone give that type of testimony in times past, we'd go, oh, wasn't that incredible that God called them to that? No, that is something that should be on every one of our lives that's not unique to just one individual. And so could you lift your hands right where you are before we go on? Father, we're asking 
for a heart development. Father, that the cry from our heart would be for the awakening and revival of future generations and this generation. Father, that uh, we would be partakers of the great harvest of souls. And God, that we would be those spiritual fathers and mothers for the interest and welfare of revival in our cities and nations. God, that we would rise up at this time. Father, right now, we just say, God, align our understanding with that is not just for the few, but that's for every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. But let me tell you what happened that morning. Even though I left without answers, I knew that God had birthed his heart on the inside of me, but there was also a determination I had. I was determined that I wanted to be able to answer those questions for others. I didn't necessarily know what the answers were, but I thought, God, I want to be able to answer these types of questions for others. Others like you, others like I was at the time. And so maybe it was immature. I made a vow to God. And this is the vow I made to God. I have it written in my Bible. I say, um, if I ever have, Greg, I believe this is supposed to be on the, oh, it is. If I ever had the privilege of being a spiritual parent to others, I would equip and invest in them, help them understand what God had called them to do, and affirm them in their identity and build platforms of success for them. That was something that God started me with. When God starts you with that, your measurement of success is not what simply comes your way, it's what you get the privilege of investing in others. And I believe that's a very kingdom principle. Now, God continued to invest a heart of reproduction and uh, his spiritual parent heart in me through my own children. And, uh, you know, this isn't a, a great time of my life that I like to relate, but my first husband left me for another uh, woman. He, he, he happened to like lots of women. And uh, uh, he left me. But as a minister, I was devastated. As a woman, I was devastated. I had three little kids. And the stream or the denomination I was with, I was sure that that disqualified me from ever be ministering again. And not only that, I didn't even know of other women that were pastoring churches. So I was already a one-off. And now I'm divorced. So I was kind of grieving over the sense of the loss that I did not think that I was going to have the privilege of being able to partner in uh, pulpit ministry with the Lord. And so as I cried over that loss, this is what I prayed to God. I said, God, could I please be my children's support? Could I go with them while they travel the world and minister, and could I carry their bags? Could I prepare a platform for my children so that they could do more and go further than I could myself? Now, as I prayed that prayer, believe me, it was not one of those prayers that came easy. You could tell in my own heart it was a sacrifice, but I recognized that it was a privilege as well. And I knew that their success would be my success. And God used what I went through and I can honestly tell you that when you tell me the victories you have in your life and the things that God gives you as opportunities and the open doors that God does, if you know me, I am totally rejoicing in that area. I don't have a, oh, I wish it should have been me or I could have or, or, or any of those things. I truly am. What I went through really developed that on the inside of me that others' success really was my success. And to this day, it's still, it's still very much true. Actually, as I get older, I think I find it even more true uh, uh, than even in my younger years. And if you know me and uh, praying that prayer, I have an incredible um, get up and go and drive. So for me to be able to pray, oh God, let me go carry their bags and their success will be my success. You don't know what a death that was. <laughs> but the other side of that was a great resurrection. And what was resurrected in me was the heart to reproduce 
on the inside of others. And so God answered my prayer, not by me being out of the ministry and carrying my children's bags, though I did get to minister with my oldest son for the last three days. I love that. Yay. All the... Um, uh, so it was incredible, but I received a heart for the future generations. But now I want to turn a bit of a corner. Then I met my father in the Lord, uh, uh, Bishop Bill Hammond. Now, he modeled God's heart of reproduction to me. I don't know if I had words to be able to describe that before that. He modeled what a prophet looked like. He modeled what a father's heart looked like to me. Now, at that time, I was not established in my identity. Now, there were some people that probably said Prophet Sharon, but I never said Prophet Sharon. There were some people that probably said Pastor Sharon, but I never said Pastor Sharon. I was really not established in my identity. But now let me share a secret with you. Whenever you're not established in your identity, there is insecurity. We're not talking about you being rejected. We're not talking about you being broken, any of those things. Until your identity has affirmation and you know that you know that you know, there's an area of insecurity. And that is not age-based. You can have that at any age. And so when he came along and demonstrated uh, uh, God's heart, prophesied over me, and affirmed my identity and destiny, let me tell you what happened. Insecurity fled and a sense of identity was established on the inside of me. So as we're talking about one of the attributes of, of, of reproducing, we're talking about your identity. We're talking about the fact where you've had the tug of war, where you've had the indecision, where you had the should have, maybe, could have, where you had I think I am, I think I am, where you've had that, that the reproducing anointing has the ability to establish you, cause roots to go down. The Word of God says that your gifts and callings make room for you. When you don't know these, and these things are not in demonstration, they're not making room for you. But when you know them and they are in demonstration, the earth is opening up and is creating a space for you to be successful in. And so part of the reproducing anointing is going to establish you in your uh, identity. And I, that was very important to me because I really did not have identity. But I want you to know, I left knowing that my purpose was to mentor generations in the apostolic and the prophetic. I knew that I knew. I didn't know what it meant. Didn't know how I was going to go about doing it. But I knew that was who I was. And so I have never tried to get my affirmation from trying to do things like Benny Hinn. I have never tried to get my affirmation from uh, uh, doing things like other great ministers. I don't try to teach like Joyce Myers. Uh, I have never tried to do that because when you know who you are, there's such a sense of authenticity. There is such a freedom that you want to represent God in the way that you were created to represent him. You want to bring your compliment to the table so that you have a higher level of appreciating others around about you, that there is freedom in that. And I often, when I'm prophesying over others, I hear the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm not making you into something you're not, but I'm freeing you to be everything that I created you to be. What an incredible statement for our God to make about each one of us. To me, that's, that, that is really what uh, freedom is. So it'll establish us in our identity. Now, what Bishop Hammond and what God uh, uh, did for me, I made another vow. And you say, Sharon, the Bible says don't make vows. I, I didn't know better. Okay, so I made another vow before God. And this is what I said. God, what you and what Bishop Hammond did for me, I want to do that for others. I want to water others' faith and others' greatness, not water their fear and insecurities. I don't want to be the, the big mama that everybody needs me. I don't want to be the Santa Claus that I have the gift that you have need of. I made a decision. God, I want what I saw demonstrated, I want to be that. 
You know what causes people to come together and what causes different parts of the body of Christ to connect in different locations? We start finding our tribe. We start finding those that have like callings and, and like understandings. It's not the fact that we don't want to expand, but there's some type of core belief here that unites us that we're going to reproduce. We are not going to be a one-off that, that we're going to be known for the legacy that we leave. And so I want to feed others greatness. So Malachi 4, 5, and 6. How's Greg doing with the plasma screen? Woohoo! Um, it says, familiar scripture, I will send Elijah the prophet in the last days, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children, uh, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Uh, the spirit of Elijah is releasing of the apostolic and prophetic anointing in these last days. It will break the curse and it will restore uh, fathers to children and children uh, to fathers. It's a good place to start when we talk about reproduce, reproducing because it is a prerequisite and it is mandatory to reproduce in order to be a spiritual parent. You cannot say, I'm a father, I'm a mother, without that reproducing go going on in your life. And a term that I've heard from Dr. Hammond for uh, over 30 years is he says, you're called to be, to, to be reproducers who reproduce reproducers. Amen. I've heard that for over 30 years, so I can, I can believe that. See, I actually believe we're living in a time right now about what I prayed for when I was 17 years old, that God would be raising up spiritual mothers. He'd be raising up spiritual fathers for the sake, for the interest and the welfare of revivals for cities and nations that he would waken the generations. I actually believed he was looking for someone who would voice those things, even though I didn't know what they were, to get those words out in the atmosphere. And uh, I did, and I'm still coming to know what those things uh, meant. But I believe that we are reproducing others. And God has privileged me to do much. And I, I'm not giving you my uh, bio, but God's given me a lot of opportunities. I've had the privilege of training prophetically over 50,000 people. And I'm being cautious there, I'm not being evangelistically speaking. I've had the opportunity to plant churches, write training material, raise an international network, minister to over 13 heads of nations, and to travel over 50 nations. Why do I say that? Oh, thank you. <laughs> and if you were traveling with me this last week, we felt like we did it all in 10 days. <laughs> but I was never content to bask in the opportunities or the influence or the power or even the glory or the encounters that the Spirit of God gave to me, always there was a sense that I wanted to, a drive within me, that I wanted to see others have the same opportunities, others uh, be equipped to operate in their giftings, to see others uh, stand on the same platforms uh, that, that I had. And so I believe that as the Spirit of the Lord put that within me, um, it fulfills what God had told my Father and the Lord um, probably almost 40 years ago. The Lord told Bishop Hammond, he said, if you would take the time to raise up others to his level, then God would always raise him up to a new level. You know what? I believe that I'm part of that fruit, that of his impact, and I believe that many of you are part of the fruit of me sowing into others. So what does that mean? Over 40 years, I have been connecting with those hungry and desperate for identity, destiny, a power of God released so that we really are aligning and building the net for a great harvest. And we have been connecting with those kind of, uh, of people. How have we been doing it? I've been investing my journey through training, equipping, prophesying, mentoring. Um, those that are closer with me, I've been doing it through sharing mistakes, <laughs> sharing victories that I've learned. I've shared supernatural encounters. Um, I've shared secrets of partnering with God. 
Let me tell you a secret. I, I can be a name dropper here. One, one afternoon I was having lunch with Rick Joyner. And he says, Sharon, tell me how you do what you do in the area of prophesying. So I shared with him. I did it briefly, about three minutes. And then I said, tell me how you do what you do. And he says, can't do that. It's a secret. And I thought, that was so off my grid. But for him, that was how the Spirit of God operated him. So I'm not saying anything about that. But you know what? I share my secrets. I share my secrets of partnering with God. Not only that, you want to hear something else? This is almost unheard of. I share my relationships. When I, when you get to know me and I introduce you to other people, you don't have to go through me to get to them. They become your relationships. And that's one of those things that you don't see often in the body of Christ. But now I realize, I didn't realize all along, but the anointing of God's heart for reproducing, this is mandatory to bring transformation to a generation. And it's part of that anointing that we carry. And so if you come to me and say, Sharon, I need you to give me place and position. I need you to give me platform. I need you to give me a place to speak and all of that. I want to see where you're reproducing. Everything within me wants to be able to see that because I believe that where you reproduce isn't what makes the difference. It's that you reproduce. So if, I'm, if you're in my living room, I would like to hope that I'm doing some reproducing there. If you're in the car and we're driving to a meeting, I'd like to hope I'm doing some reproducing there. I would like to think that that is part of a lifestyle, not part of a platform ministry uh, that God has given us. Now, just so that you know that I'm being scriptural, Jesus took 12 young men and reproduced himself in him, and they turned the world upside down. Moses imparted into 70 elders, and they became judges and brought righteousness and justice amongst the people of the children uh, of Israel at that time. And so God is looking for, I think Greg's putting this on the plasma screen, God is looking for good sons and daughters that will be great fathers and mothers who know how to reproduce the very life and anointing of God in others. I was just with a whole group of young prophets for three days. And can I tell you, most of them never had spiritual parenting. They were part of some good churches, but most of them did not have opportunities to be raised up in their calling area. And so, you know, you can see how it affected different ones, some more positively because it made them depend on God in a greater way, some maybe a little more uh, negative because they're looking for that affirmation that they, that they never got. And I believe that's a part of youth anyway, to, to look for that. So I'm not speaking negatively about that. But regardless of your age, God is looking for good sons and daughters that will be good fathers and mothers who will take what they have and re reproduce the lifing, the gifting, and the power in it within other people. Now, you know, the Apostle Paul understood this. And I'm going to start closing right here. Um, in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 1 through 2, I believe the scripture's on your plasma. Paul challenges his t son Timothy here. He challenges him to take the things that Paul has been teaching him the things that Paul has been imparting to him and teach and impart those things to others who are faithful, who have a proven walk uh, in the Lord and that, they, and that they would do the same uh, with lives that they touched. Isn't that incredible? For those of you that didn't read that scripture, it says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will also be able to teach others also. Can I just share this from my heart? Paul knew these ones he was training, whether it was Timothy or others, they were going to face hardships. They were going to face persecutions. They were going to face situations that was going to rock their life. They were going to face situations where, see, man can give favor, man can take it away. You know, they were going to face all of those things. And so he knew that by him being a good spiritual father and reproducing them, he was offering them a stability that when those times came, that those would not be points that would cause their life to be shipwrecked, 
but they would already be prepared because they had been reproduced on, uh, in, in their lives. And I love how, how Paul says, you know, get, uh, put it in you, you can put it into others. So again, the reproducing anointing will bring transformation to the generations. Um, now, most of the time when people think about myself or they think about Christian or National Europe, the only thing they think about is the reproducing of the prophetic. And that's, and that's wonderful. I absolutely love that. I believe if you can hear the voice of God, you can be obedient to anything that God asks you to do. So it's not just reproducing other prophets or other prophetic people. But I also believe that fathers and mothers impart courage and wisdom. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Do you know it takes a massive amount of courage to be obedient to the dream that the Spirit of God has put on the inside of you? Why do you think that God kept speaking to Joshua as he's getting ready to cross over in the promised land? Only be strong and courageous. Only be strong and courageous. He knew it was going to take a lot of courage to be able uh, uh, to follow what Jesus has asked you to do. Listen, your dream should scare you. It really should. If your dream doesn't scare you, something's wrong there. It ought to be big enough that it scares you. Mine still scares me. We were just invited to, uh, I don't want to say this wrong, invited to be able to go to Washington, D.C. and have an opportunity to speak to several different political figures in this next year. Right, Greg? I'll tell you what. Well, first of all, I don't feel called to go. I, honestly, I really don't. I, I, I'm definitely going to push people in that direction that I do feel called to go. I, I baffle Apostle Tommy all the time with different meetings that we turn down. When you know your part, you know your part. You know, but now am I going to Parliament next week? Absolutely. I, I, I know my part, you know, that's, so I feel, feel very comfortable there. But when she was saying it, you know, I was taking it in stride, and she kind of got pushy by it, didn't she? A little pushy um, uh, concerning it. And, I, and I, I realized it made me nervous. You know, the bigness of what God asks you to do should make you nervous. It should make you nervous. It should scare you just a little bit. Why? You're going to have to depend on him all the more. You're get, you, you don't have a choice to be, to, but to be able to do that. But if spiritual fathers and mothers have the ability to impart courage and wisdom, do you know what encourage means? It means put courage inside somebody. That's what it means. So even the basic definition of the prophetic, when we're called to bring what? Edification, exhortation, and comfort. We're called to help put courage on the inside of you as we reproduce uh, within the midst of you. So um, I appreciate, how many people know when you're around really good reproducers and fathers in the spirit, how you feel very courageous? Absolutely. You feel like you could take risks that you could never take at another time. I, I feel that way often when I'm around great men and women. So we put courage in front of others. I think one of the examples that I see is Esther, we have the orphan girl. Now she was a concubine, at, you know, um, not a not a, a position to be uh, 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 desired, and uh, a, a a wife, and she's frightened, and yet her spiritual father Mordecai said, "Suppose you've come." to the kingdom of God for such a time as this. What did he do? He put courage on the inside of her where she's going, no, 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 no. All of a sudden, the next verse, she goes, if I die, I die. Whew, where did that come from? She just had courage imparted on the inside of her. And I am ending here. This is what I want to do tonight. And I bet you didn't even know this was a scripture. Deuteronomy 34.9. Did you know wisdom can be imparted? Turn to your neighbor and say, oh, thank God. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you don't have to have experiences. It doesn't mean that you don't have trial and error. It doesn't mean that you don't study. It doesn't mean that you don't learn from the lives of others. All of those things that are necessary. But the Bible also speaks about imparting wisdom. I remember when I got my first Bible software. I won't even tell you what year that was. But I remember looking at it, and I remember, oh, 
you know, it seemed so complicated to me at the time because it did, was not very user friendly to me. But I knew I had to learn how to do this. And I remember sitting at Dr. Hammond's desk with him because we were both learning at the same time. And I said to him, you know, I would rather, instead of being hooked up to this computer, I'd rather just have a few minutes hooked up to your brain. You know, and I, I really said that because he's quite a theologian, you know, and he's, but I mean, I, I meant it, and I meant it out of respect. And he said, well, Sharon, I can't give you my thoughts, but I can impart wisdom. And the next thing I knew, he had hands laid on me, and I thought, he has imparted to me gifts before, he's imparted me the presence of God before, he's, he's imparted me strength before, but all of a sudden, he was imparting wisdom in, into me and I laid my head on his desk and I cried and cried you know how when you're getting something from God you're not quite sure what it is but you love the presence and you don't want it to stop that was one of those moments I don't know if he stayed in the room or whether he left but I mean you know uh, about an hour or so later when I lifted my head you know there was a puddle there on on his desk and my mascara was down to here but he was imparting wisdom and when I spoke to him about it this was the scripture that he had given me, Deuteronomy 34, 9. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, you know, we know Joshua that, uh, 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 that followed Moses, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him, and they did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Is that just an incredible scripture? It says if you don't get it, he received it by the impartation of laying on of hands, and the people responded to it because there was enough wisdom there that they could tell. Listen, I know in life there is not a lot of, um, of um, not fast tracks, what's the other word? Shortcuts, there. There's not a lot of shortcuts in life. God can redeem our time, God can accelerate us, but there's not a lot of shortcuts. I believe this is a shortcut. Maybe one of the few that I have ever found. Doesn't negate any of those other types of getting wisdom that you have to get. But this is one of the few. And I believe we're going to take advantage of this tonight. Amen? So Joshua learned wisdom not only by life experiences, but also by the impartation. And we see that it really paved a success track uh, for him. That is reproducing. So to truly be apostolic, it means that we have to have a heart that reproduces. But can I just add one more thing? I don't believe just spiritual parents invest in spiritual children, regardless of their age. I believe when it says the hearts of the children are turned toward the fathers, I learn from those I invest in. Uh, uh, Apostle Tommy and I had the privilege of ministering a week long and, and hungry uh, to almost 1,500 people. And uh, we shared, one session we shared on what he learned from me, and then I shared on what I'd learned from him. You know, I don't know how much other people were blessed, but I was highly blessed. I, 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 it was a special time for me. It, it really was. But I could share because my life has been changed by, by having uh, those that I have invested in and what they have brought back and what they have invested on the inside of me. It, it has changed that. But I'll tell you, one of the things that, that has been invested back to me is this. You cannot have real relationship without hanging out with someone. That may not sound like a big deal. Just because we get together in a room doesn't produce that. Just because churches come together and pray in their community does not produce real relationship. But I want to take it a step further. I really believe that apostolic and the prophetic is called to revelational relationships. That means we got to know one another after the Spirit. we got to so appreciate and value and esteem that which the Spirit of God has put on, on the inside of one another. And that means I hunger for the strengths that God's put in you, and I want, I, I want to share those. But also, I want to invest in you. And I'm going to say something I've probably never said out loud before, because I always say I feel called to release others into their greatness. But I've never said this before. I believe I have something that brings greatness to others. I really believe I do. 
And it is God's heart of reproducing. And that is part of what the Spirit of God has put within me that releases greatness. And so I want to, uh, maybe we can get the worship team if you could come back up. I, I know I didn't ask you, but if we could uh, do that. There's several things uh, that I want to do right now. When you have courage, you take risks. All the stuff that God has spoke to you, every dormant promise, every dream yet to be fulfilled, all of a sudden, when courage has been imparted into you, who it's like it's activated, it's like it's fresh, it's like it's brand new for the first time. It's like, whoo, get out of my way, I've got to step out on the water. Who cares what the other 11 are doing? Rather than always going, well, what, what are they doing? What are they doing? You know, what are they doing? No, courage has the ability to release the leader on the inside of you. Because everybody is called the lead. And it releases that leader within the midst of you. And if you're going to reproduce in somebody else, you know who they go to to have it reproduce? A leader. But we can all be that. And so I'm just going to ask uh, uh, Apostle Tommy if he'll come up here with me. And we're going to take a moment, and we're just going to lay hands on all of you that, that, that desire it. And then we're going to prophesy. I, I hope you don't leave. Uh, but if you need to, we understand. But we're going to lay hands, and we're going to release that reproducing anointing. We're going to release it with courage, and we're going to impart wisdom. Amen? And others have imparted that to us, and so we have the ability to impart that to others as well. But remember how we started this? Dr. Hammond said, I think you guys know how to pray well. I think you know how to believe well. I'm not sure you know how to receive well. This is our moment. You can't afford not to receive well. Right? So how do I receive? Can I just tell you my own little secret? Okay? Nobody's ever told this to me, so... When I get in a receiving mode, this is what I do. I recognize that I have need. That there's barrenness, that there's emptiness, that there's void in every one of us. And God's wanting to top that off and overflow. Okay? So I'm not asking God to, to come and wet the river that's already wet. I'm not asking God to come and bless what's already blessed. I take a moment and just identify, ah, oh, what, what great need I have. What a void I have in my own life. How much more hunger I have that isn't yet satisfied. How much more of God I want to know. Not only know, but know. And when I do that, there's something about the condition or the alignment that that brings you that it becomes like a vacuum. And so when somebody lays hands on me, it's like, <laughs> it just sucks it right up. And it sucks it up at a, 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 a level of need where it, it attaches right to where it's supposed to. So it's not like it's just something offered to me. If somebody ever given you a gift and you, you're not quite sure the protocol and you go, well, do I open it here or do I open it later? <laughs> you know, isn't that true? We all do that. And somehow we're like that when sometimes God wanting to impart on the inside of us. <gasps> do I open it here or do I open it later? We don't want you just to open it. We want you to drink it and receive it. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. I'm just sharing with you a bit of experience. The other thing is, is when I turn around and impart to somebody else, what I do, I can't impart, impart out of my emptiness. I have to impart out of what has been given to me. So when I have people say, just tell me what to teach, tell me what to do, and I say, what are you carrying? Because I realize it's, it's the overflow that we get. What is it that you're carrying? Because we want, we, we want to be able to have them inside of each other. But I'll tell you what, I invest in others. I know that we've got the Spirit of God within us. But I'll tell you what, I, you don't have to, please don't take my style. But I get into the lightning rod position. You know, one hand up toward heaven, the other hand on somebody else. Why did I just do that? Now, don't make, a, don't make that legalistic or anything. But what am I doing? 
That's just, to me, that is just positional where my heart is right there. I realize the source. Whoa, the source. I'm connecting to that source, you know? And some people, oh, I just want to be a vessel for God, a vessel for God, a vessel for God. Just flow through me, God. That is not how I say, God, I want their healing and heal me while it's going to them. You know, oh, God, I want their deliverance. Deliver me while it's going to them. Oh, God, you know, I want an encounter. Whoo, bring me the encounter while you're releasing it to them. You don't believe God's that big? God is incredibly that big. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, impart. How many here has ever said somebody has imparted wisdom to me before? They can't. See, people forget that that's biblical based. So, what is Tommy and I gonna do? Because he's not going for my mind. I'm not going for Dr. Hammond's mind. We're going for the mind of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah.